Hoffman, who's uh, going to talk to us about mainly about his uh, entrepreneurial work with two companies. We've talked, I've sent you emails and links and so forth, uh, mostly about the, uh, the tea over in, in traveling in the back country of China, finding some of the rarest and finest and best tea in the world. And, you know, from, I watched the full documentary or most of it last night. It seems like a product that you. Uh, you discovered, you fell in love with, and decided to try to bring it to the United States. And that started in the, was the early 90s? I first started drinking teas in the 60s. And then it wasn't until 1990 when I started going to China to actually support my own habit of drinking tea and not being able to find it in this country. All right. So, you know, he found a tea that is, you know, of a much higher quality than you would probably find in most any store here in this country. And we'll, I, have a, I have a short snippet from that video, or the documentary, this, uh, I sent it, a link to you last night. It's about two and a half minutes out of the 70 minute video that gets to kind of introduce that, that venture because it was near the, the beginning of his uh, work with T as an entrepreneur. He's not, he, after that, he's gonna, he's gonna back up. There's another, he founded a, uh, was it a sonic cleaning process for documents in museums and so forth. And he told me over lunch that there's a connection between those two, but I don't know what it is. So he's going to talk about starting up the, the founding of the, the cleaning process and how that is somehow also connected uh, with the tea. So let me go ahead and show that short video to uh, just give you a little feel for the startup of the uh, tea company. That's me in Mexico with the bingo bear. <laughs> This is some of the best tea I've seen here. Uh, see? Nice aroma. Very young, very good quality. He would probably sell for a lot less, but I'd rather pay him higher, let people know that we will pay high price for high quality tea. The person who made this tea is highly skilled, highly skilled. Unless someone discovers him very soon, he's going to be gone. Really premium tea, high quality tea, is a handcrafted product. No two tea makers can make the same quality handcrafted tea. I'm saying that the farmer has better teas than the factories. So I need someone who is willing to come with me to go out to the farms to establish relationships with the farmers. Because that tea we tasted today, we should know who that farmer was. People are finding that tea is a very different experience from coffee. Buttery, vegetal, rich, fragrant, not flowery, slightly, we'll say, oceanic. What the French call with wine, the goût de terroir, the taste of the dirt. You see, it's very apparent. It's unbelievable to me that we can legally dump millions of tons of carcinogenic chemicals into our environment, on our food. Are they interested in earthworms? Yes, it's not. Uh, it's the poop that comes out of the worm. The shit. The shit. The shit. The shit. The shit. Worms are perhaps the most important link in the sustainability of life. We will provide all the fertilizer for free in return for some tea. <laughs> because there is so much interest in the health benefits of tea now, we are promoting organic tea farming. We look very forward to working many years in the future with uh, all the tea farmers in China. I want to select the teas, take that tea and physically put it in one place and say, that's the tea that I want. Not something else that's similar to that. Why? All right, with that as our short introduction, let's uh, welcome to class David Lee Hoffman. He's going to talk again about both the T joint venture and also his other joint venture work that led it. Thank you. I'm actually going to back up a, a 
few years before my second venture because I had spent 10 years living on the road, living very simply, not spending much money. And uh, I came back to this country and for a while I was able to survive quite well on $300 a month income. I had uh, made sound recordings during my travels, uh, mostly with the Tibetans and recordings in India. I produced three record albums and one book, and my $300 a month was taken care of by what I brought in with that. But then I got married, and I had a child, and pretty soon I needed more money to sustain my life style, which was building. I spent 40 years building on my property, but I also had to be a provider as a father. So one of the things that I brought back with me were textiles from Asia. And it turned out that many of these textiles were very valuable. So I sold a few, but then I needed to conserve them. And I spent the next couple of years learning the art of conservation. And one of the things I developed was a cleaning apparatus that used sonic vibration to gently agitate the textiles and put that into solution and then flush it with uh, super clean water, deionized water, uh, which is very aggressive because it has all the, the ions removed and it wants to pull out other uh, contaminants in the textile, the rinse process. Uh, sometimes uh, mistakes or bad things can lead to something good. And I've never told this publicly because I was always a little bit ashamed of it. But I read in the newspaper during the Vietnam War that some uh, captured prisoners were killed by putting them in a wooden barrel and hitting the side of the barrel with the stick to, to end their life without any trace of how it was done. And I read that, and I was first disgusted with all wars, all acts of war, how they, they treat their prisoners. But it started my mind thinking that you can transfer sound vibration through an aqueous solution. So I did some in, initial experiment, experimentation with this, and I made a little uh, vibrator that used uh, distilled water and I took textiles. I, I took a 15th century textile that was in very bad condition. I cut it into little segments. And one I simply uh, washed with water solution. And the other I put in my little vibrator, my sonic cleaning uh, tank. And I was so astonished the change in that textile only from sonic vibration. So I went on to, to build a very large tank in a, sy uh, a system that I could adjust not only the frequency but the amplitude. So I was able to adjust the sonic vibration to the textile I was cleaning. No one else was doing this, so I pretty soon had lots of customers, including museums and private collectors, because I was really able to transform years of contamination into a very clean and vibrant textile. And that was certainly part of my pleasure in cleaning, because I, I love textiles, and it grew into a very nice business. Even though I wasn't trying to do that, I had so much, uh, uh, so many customers that would come to me and say, you know, I need this textile cleaned. So it was all fine, but uh, after a few years of working on beautiful pieces, pieces that were literally worth more than my house I was living in, it was somewhat stressful because I didn't want to make mistakes and ruin a thousand dollar 
piece of textile. So I got into tea just to balance that out. So I thought, you know, I, I have to relax more. And, uh, I was a tea drinker for many years. I first got introduced to nice teas with the Tibetan refugees back in the 60s. And I immediately developed a liking for a type of tea called Pu'er. It's an aged tea that the Tibetan people were drinking. The way they drink tea is they, they add rancid yak butter and a bit of salt to it. We say yak butter, but actually the yak is, is the male counterpart of the dream. But if I say dream or dream, of, no one's going to know what that is. But the yak is, is uh, uh, a high altitude cattle that makes very good milk products. So this is how they make their tea. They take very ripe butter and mix it with the tea and churn it up. So that was my start with Pu'er tea. Well, I started going to China because I couldn't find any good tea in this country. And the tea business took off so quickly, I couldn't keep up with the supply. And in a very short time, I had to make a decision. Am I going to go with the tea business or go with textiles? And it was a difficult decision to make because both the businesses were very good. And I wasn't a businessman from, by nature. In fact, I've had no business education whatsoever. <coughs> what I learned, I think, was little things from my father, who grew up in an orphanage. And he got out of the orphanage when he was 17 years old, had no money, fell in love with my mother, who went, went to become my mother, and uh, he had no money, and uh, my mother at the time said to him, look, you don't have any money, I'm not going to marry you. But as soon as you make $300 a month, I think that was a figure, I'll marry you. So he became quite successful. And when he retired, he was able to sell his company to General Mills, and I think he did quite well for himself. But he would say things like, you know, there's only one rule you have to remember when you're working for someone. You have to do the best you can. Just do the best you can. And it made sense to me, as when I took on jobs and worked for other people, I truly did that. I did the best I could to make them happy. And uh, then when I started traveling, I basically stopped working, except to get a little bit of money what I needed for travel. So I washed dishes in, in Lapland up in northern uh, Scandinavia. I taught English in Barcelona. I rolled up my sleeve and sold my blood for enough money that I could travel for uh, five or six weeks on. I had my German Blutspender card. But I wasn't interested in making money. That wasn't what was interesting to me. I wanted to be able to continue living and traveling on the, on the road. So that's what I did. So once the tea business started growing, it completely changed my life. I had to learn how to be a businessman. And it wasn't from anything I learned in books or from even other people. I would ask about things. But my accounting ability was like a 10-year-old. I had two books that I used to run my business. All the money that came in went in one book. All the money that went out went in the other book. And every month, I'd make sure that there was more money coming in than what was going out. And that's how I ran my business. It worked fine for a while, but we got too big. And by the time 2004 came around, I, I was making doing a million dollars a year out of my garage. And I thought, wow, this is, this is good, but I don't have a life anymore. I was sleeping three and a half hours a night. Uh, you know, I enjoyed the business. I enjoyed my customers. <coughs> I certainly enjoyed tea. But it, was, it took over my life. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? 
I tried hiring people, but I'd hire people for the wrong reasons. I'd hire them because they're a relative, a friend, because their husband ran out on them and they had three kids and needed a job. And it, it, every time I took someone on and left the country, my business would go down. So it was a dilemma for me. I, I didn't know how to resolve that one. So many people I tried to bring in, but I had to recognize my weakness, which was the ability to hire the right people for the right job. I was not qualified for that. I was good at finding tea. I could go to China. I could go off in the mountains, which was a totally crazy thing for me to do. Why? I didn't speak Chinese. You know? I had no connections there. <coughs> I had a friend who was a curator in the Asian Art Museum. And I said, Teresa, would you do me a favor? She's Chinese. I said, please write me a little note in Chinese. And it said, please help me. I'm an American. I've come to China to buy tea. And that's what I used to go through in China. Well, it was great. Uh, uh, people bent over backwards. There was no one over there doing what I was doing. Even the Chinese didn't do that. Nobody goes off into the mountains to buy directly from the farmers. So, what happened? Well, lots of things happened. I ended up getting arrested for being in places where I should be, with no permit. You know, who are you? What are you doing out here? But after a while, I was put on national television. I, I was buying tea, and I was someone the farmers would seek out. And here I was in town, and they traveled from miles away to come and see me, to show me tea. And I was able to find and buy great tea. So the challenge for me wasn't finding the tea. The real challenge was getting it out of China, getting it back here. How to do this? I did everything. I first started going to the post office and uh, you know, I could send back maybe two kilos, three kilos at a time. It's nothing. And then I had to get addresses of all the different post offices, because if you sent over a certain limit, then you weren't allowed to do that. So I had to each time go to a different post office. But pretty soon, it, it, it wasn't working, because I couldn't get the quantity I needed, and the freshness, and uh, there's more problems with traveling uh, in China with actually physically taking the tea that I wanted to send back. I remember being on a bus once, and I had a beautiful sack of tea, and of course all the cargo goes up on the roof of the bus. And we're driving along, and it started raining. I said, oh my god, my tea's going to get ruined, and I got up my phrase book, and I tried to communicate with the driver that I have to cover the tea, and all to go there. My, my Chinese was terrible. After a few years, I was able to know enough of the language that I could buy tea any place in China. But uh, you know, handling the the situation with exporting tea out of China was a whole other matter. So I went to the export company. I went to many export. Here's the situation. I bought tea, how can I get it out of the country? I'm happy to pay you whatever you want. I just need the tea packed properly and exported. So they put one roadblock after another in my path. Why? Because they wanted to sell the tea that they have on hand. They have relationships with their farms, and that's the only tea they're interested in exporting. So I finally made some kind of agreement that I'd buy some of their tea if they'll export my tea. Well, that didn't work out because, frankly, I wasn't excited about the tea. I was able to accept a certain portion of it, but I was really more interested in 
exporting the teas that I found because I know I knew my market in America for the kind of teas that I wanted. And they didn't know it. They they went after the common teas that anyone could buy. And when I first started bringing my teas back here, I take them to the big tea companies. And they laughed at me. What, $20 a pound? You gotta be kidding. We're paying a dollar twenty for this tea, and this one's only ninety-eight cents a pound. And and they didn't get it. Now those same companies are paying 60, 80, 100 dollars a pound for the same tea because they know that tea has value. A handcrafted, with great skill, rare teas. You know, you can't go out into any shop, <coughs> supermarket, anywhere in this country and find those kinds of tea. Now it's changing somewhat but not to the degree with the kind of teas I was finding back there. So here I had a, a, a business. I had to find someone who could export the teas for me without the involvement of the export companies. So I find people who I trusted, and you have to trust them. What else can you do? You have to trust. And I had one failure after another. People would, I'd leave them all my tea, and it wouldn't come, it wouldn't come, it wouldn't come. And next year, I go back, and I said, you know, I gave you all this money. I never received the tea. Oh, I'm so sorry. We couldn't get the right permit to export the tea. And by then, the tea was finished. It was worthless. No use at all. So. Stop that channel, try another one. Who else? Eventually, I found people that I could work with, people I could trust, people that maybe didn't know the business world, because you have to imagine China was just leaving the communist era. It's still considered a communist country, but not the communism that I knew back then. Now they have what they call a free market economy. So anything goes. Anything goes meaning if you give them your tea, if you give them money, they say, oh, this is good tea. I'll buy something else at a lower price and send this tea out in its place. They thought nothing's wrong with that. They figure, you know, what does a foreigner know about tea? We're Chinese, we know what tea is. Americans could possibly know. So they did the old switching trick. You know, I buy tea, and uh, of course, I bring samples. I developed my own methodology of buying tea and bringing it back. And I always bring back samples of everything I buy with a notebook with all my notes in it. Um, so again, I had to go through the weeding out process. You know, sometimes I make allowance one time if it was an honest mistake, but if, if, if it was a bad mistake where I just didn't trust them, then I would never use them again. So relationships in China are very precious. You have to take care of them. If you have a good person you're working with, you have to honor and respect that relationship. And that means learning enough about the Chinese culture, the protocol, and the, the ways of doing business that make sense to them, not to me. For me, it was very simple. I wanted to be able to buy the tea, get exactly the tea <coughs> I bought, and have that shipped back to the States. That's all I wanted. And I'm happy to pay everyone in between. And I did. There's some amazing scenes where, you know, I bought the tea from the farmer. Oh, I didn't pay tax on it. So we go to the tax department. I pay the tax department. Oh, this tax is only for, for this district here. To take it out of the province, you have to pay this tax. 
So then I paid another tax to get it out of that province to get it to Shanghai or to Shanghai. So I paid twi tax twice already. Then I have to pay another tax to get it out of the country. And it just went on and on. It was so complex. And everyone was doing it, you know, just on the moment because there was no precedent for doing anything I was doing. So it was a very interesting challenge in the early days in China. But in some ways, it was easier doing business back then than it is now. Not the business part. I still have my old relationships that I've kept going over the years. People that I trust that will front me $100,000 on a handshake. Not even a handshake. Here's the money. After you sell the tea, send the money back to me. I could disappear and walk off of that money, but they trusted me and I trusted them and that was our relationship. So, uh, but what happened now, you know, the interesting thing has happened. China <coughs> has over one million millionaires now. One million millionaires, and that's dollar millionaires, not one. Uh, this is a huge amount of money for China. And we all know that because we can go down to our local hardware store and I know where I live, 85% of the merchandise was from China. One of the workers told me that. I was shocked, even though I saw it. They make 85% uh, of the world's shoes comes from China. So this is a double-edged sword. You know, it was great that China was able to bring itself up in, to get out of their poverty, but the poverty didn't trickle down to the workers. It's those who were clever enough during the free market economy to be entrepreneurs in China. And they did very well with it. Because one, they recognized our weakness for cheap goods. We're still the number one consumer of Chinese products. But we haven't really started to see that, well, we are starting to see the downside of that now because we've broken the back, they've broken the backbone of the American industry. I see factory after factory shutting down in this country. You know, all the machine shops and forges and factories that I grew up with are all shut down. Steel yards are gone. And now we think we're doing well because a few corporations at the top are making lots of money. Whereas the unemployment rate suffering. So it's a double-edged sword. Yes, we have cheap goods, but at what expense? Expense <coughs> losing the American <coughs> edge on manufacturing. So it's a tricky situation. You know, and yes, I go there to buy tea, and uh, there's still, you know, it's a fine story. <coughs> But it really saddens me to see what's happening to America. So if I had to rethink everything over again and I wanted to go in business, I would try and think of a way that involved Americans, you know, involved the community. And my business was sweet because I never really learned how to grow a business. But I started enough tea companies in this country that went on to become multi-million dollar companies. And one company just sold out to Starbucks. And another is in all the, the, the supermarket shelves and restaurants. So if you're clever with business, you could, you could do well with it. But for me, my goal wasn't to see how big I could get. It was to make enough money to pay my bills. In the early days, I, I, I lived off $300 a month, and I could do that. Now it's, it's far greater than that. Did you have a question? Yeah. Do you only import tea from China, or do you like, go elsewhere? And... Uh, I only import tea. 
and teapots, teaware. Uh, but I have many friends who export other things too. And I'm, of course, aware of a lot of the trade shows. I, I did bring in farm equipment because I was interested in small-scale agricultural use. So I brought in three small tractors, I brought in two small combines, and a lot of other small-scale farm equipment, which China is great for and that we don't manufacture in this country. I would love to see one of those combines reverse-engineered over here, like they do over there with all our technology. But because, you know, we not only gave them the engineering, we often gave them the equipment to make the goods for us so we could have our cheap <coughs> merchandise. And of course, as soon as they get the equipment, then they take it apart, and take it to their factories and make the same equipment. So we've given them the free engineering and the free technology so that they would make cheap products for us. Sustainable? So, um, Terry gave me a list of some good questions as guidelines here, and I thought the, the questions were very good, and I'm just going to go through them. Uh, someone may have already answered. Um, uh, what is my competitive advantage over competition? Well, I think that's obvious. No one else was doing what I was doing. Now that's all changed. Uh, there's a lot of people going to China. And I started to say what the current situation is. With a million millionaires in China, they have changed the tea market more than anything else I've faced. Why is that? They did a survey in China. They asked all these new or rich people, how do you spend your money? Number one, travel. Number two, luxury goods. Gucci shoes and whatnot. Number three, tea. China is an avid country. I mean, tea drinkers, everyone loves tea. And the higher the price for the tea, the better it is to buy as a gift. And I've had so many people tell me in China, you know, if you can't sell the tea, raise the price. If it still doesn't sell, Raise the price again. And eventually, when you have such a high price on something and nice packaging, they think, oh, this must be very special. So I'm in competition. That's my competition now. Our Chinese buyers, that for the most part don't have the palate, they don't know what good tea is, but they're driving the price up and up. So I don't know what the future is going to be. And I'm going to be 70 next year, and I don't know how many years I could keep going back to China. I've been doing it for 23 years now. So um, it's a sweet business, but um, you know you have to constantly keep changing. And that's the thing about the business world in today's economy. It's being flexible and being able to change. And the things I learned back then don't really relate to what's going on in today's world. The dollar's going down. You know, when I was traveling, when I first started traveling, the Swiss franc was a stable currency, about 4.3 to the dollar. Now it's, it's about 0.9. So the dollar has lost something like 82% of its value against the Swiss franc. Why? We don't have anything to back up our currency other than the trust and confidence that the dollar is going to remain strong. Well, it hasn't. And, and right now, it's China that's keeping the dollar afloat. And for the first time in our history, never has a foreign country control the value of the U.S. dollar, but that's what's happening now. If China decides to sell all their treasury bonds, what's going to happen with the dollar? If China decides that we're not on such good terms, 
anymore, and they don't have the military strength to go up against us. What do they have to do? They just stop exporting to America. What do you think would happen if we could not receive Chinese goods anymore? Now, there's a good chance for bringing in your entrepreneurial spirit, but how can you do that in such a short time? You know, the tooling, the retooling of our factories to get our factories running again, it's going to take a tremendous amount of work and expense. So, you know, how are we going to do that? I don't have solutions, but I see a big problem ahead because the dollar is continuing to slide. So, I think the new business model, this is just my opinion, but we have to somehow establish a new paradigm for doing business in this country. And I choose to live here because I love America. I love the, the innovation, our great thinkers. You know, so many great things come from China, but we're losing that edge of development. And China now has taken the lead. I'm looking at photovoltaic panels and solar panels and wind power and hybrid cars. China is making that with their own engineers now. So I'm sorry I can't say something more positive except that we have to find a way to develop a new way of doing business. And I'm sorry that we're wasting so much of our time with military might. You know, I, I paid $418,000 in taxes a few years back. And to think that $250,000 of that went into the military is not a good use of our taxpayer money. We should be putting money into the future for the planet. Solar, wind, giving jobs to America, finding things that the planet needs, not to make corporations more wealthy, because we do live in a very corporate-dominated world now. And frankly, I don't think it's healthy for the future of our planet or the future of our economy. And it's maybe not what people want to hear now, especially in the business class, but I've, I've managed to eke out a living. I, I didn't get wealthy from my business because I'm not smart with business. You know, I, what money I had, I, was, I got involved with, with uh, giving some money back to things I cared about. Like the place where I live is very beautiful and it has the highest breast cancer rate in the country. I was shocked. So I gave money to, to the organization, Breast Cancer Watch, and I wanted to find out you know, why, what's going on here with breast cancer. And they had a, a program where uh, my name was mentioned. Everyone involved with the breast cancer had a title after their name, and I didn't. I was the only one on there without a, a title. So since then, I started putting David Lee Hoffman, the CDO. Anyone know what CDO stands for? Now you're probably going, it's college dropout. <laughs> I never made it through college. <laughs> so I don't have a formal education. I'm not smart with so many things. I struggle through life. But I think I have the ability to, to examine <coughs> issues from a different perspective. And when I think of the great minds in this country that are able to create you know, uh, spaceships that go to the moon and, and, you know, things like this. Why can't we take that technology and use it for something good on the planet? Solar pumping in dry areas and, and photovoltaics. Why are we so addicted to oil, which is creating havoc with the planet? Global warming. You know, we have to, we have to get off this oil addiction if we want to survive as a planet. So there's tremendous opportunity in the business world, but we have to change our, our goals, I think, on what makes for a good business. How 
how do we survive on this planet and have a business that provides not only jobs for Americans, which has got to be foremost. We have to take care of our own people rather than going overseas and, and looking for someone to develop products for us at you know, very low wages. And I've seen it all over there. I, I, I've seen it all. It's, there's got to be more to employment than just seeing how cheap you can produce a product and how much pro profit you can make. In the city. And I didn't think my talk was going to go in this direction, but it did. And I apologize if I've gotten off track a little bit, but these are issues I yeah, like. One thing I wanted to make sure that I asked you, you, you said something to me last night, we didn't really have time to talk about it. You said that you had, what was it, quit your business many times, but you, yeah. you kept coming back to it. Why, why did you quit, and why did you keep coming back? Uh, thank you. Uh, I quit many times because I got so frustrated trying to do business in China and losing so much money that uh, you know, it was only because I had my textile business that kept my tea business afloat. But I kept coming back to it. And I think the, the lesson to be learned in that is what Winston Churchill said back in the Second World War. Never, never, never give up. And if you have a dream, if you have a passion to do something, then stick with it. If it's meaningful to you, stick with it. And don't, don't get caught up in the money, because money is a distraction, you know. Too many people don't follow their dream because they think, oh, I don't have money to do it. But money is changing, and if you have a good plan, you will get support. I believe that, and you will get people to follow you and support you with good ideas. And I see this as a good opportunity now in this mixed up world we're living in where nothing seems to make sense anymore. But we have a future. We have to care about that. And you're all going to be going out in, in the world and I think there's tremendous opportunity to develop businesses which are environment friendly, which actually help the planet and help the community and help people get jobs. So, why did I keep going back? <laughs> I guess I just didn't know anything else. I mean, I, <laughs> I had so many times said, that's it, I'm done with it. And uh, now I, I would love to keep going back, but I will be 70 next year. <laughs> I think I can't just keep doing this forever, so I may have to find another business to get involved with because um, I can't afford to retire. You know, I didn't make money. I, I still have to work. You know, I thought all the money I, I had to pay in taxes would be part of that, would be my retirement. But uh, it didn't turn out that way. I'm not clever with taxes either. So, uh, Any other questions? Yes. Uh, is it possible to reverse engineer the tea industry and, and make the the, import some Chinese farmers over here and and do what they do over sure, there. Sure, if you could find American workers who will work for 50 cents an hour. <laughs> I mean, it's tea is a bad example because the kind of tea I was going after was truly the handcrafted mm -hmm. teas. And we do have a tea industry in, in North Carolina. Um, but no, we can't compete with cheap labor. And the Chinese are truly masters at their craft. I have such a love and appreciation for the Chinese tea farmers. And there were 8 million tea farmers in China when I first started. That number is cut in half now. Because they have a problem now. There's so many people making money that nobody wants to work for $30 a month anymore. And how can you blame them? So the biggest challenge they have in China now are, are finding people who are willing to pick tea for very low wages. So that whole market is changing. 
And two, I think, now I, I saw this in the documentary, so you correct me or add to it, but some of the teas that you're dealing with are coming from trees that were, what, 700 years old? Exactly. 25, 25 feet of root yeah. under the ground, and, and the tea is so good in part because of the nutrients that it gets. So you couldn't transplant something like that to this country. Mm -hmm. You just, you just couldn't have the quality, yeah. correct? Is that? But let me backtrack a minute. I made a mistake. I said, no, we can't do it here. But I was invited to do the seminar with all the new tea farmers in the Hawaiian Islands. There's a whole, well, I, 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 I did workshops with 11 of the different growers back there. And I was so excited and encouraged by what they were doing. And now I just received some samples from some of their teas. Yes, they can make a really good tea in this country. So it does happen. But I don't know how many people are willing to pay the price that they need to sell that tea at. So I don't know. Yes? You mentioned before that one of your, something about Starbucks and how you kind of had something to do with that and you have your tea now. So how did, in the beginning, did you distribute it, get it out with other, did people come to you or? Yeah, I was fortunate. Uh, I never had to do any marketing <coughs> in any of my work. And I don't know the magic in that formula, but somehow everything I did got picked up by a newspaper or a magazine or a book, and I got free promotion, if you want, just from the press. And I think if you have an original idea, that no one else has done, and you make it interesting, make it newsworthy, someone's going to pick it up, and someone's going to read that story and say, oh, I'm interested in this. So I, I was fortunate. I never had to do any kind of advertising or marketing or promotion. It was all done for me. And I even had magazines that, that picked up my story and said, you know, we'll give you a, a page of, of advertising, a portion of the page. And I didn't even take advantage of that sometime because my business was growing too fast. For years it was doubling. Every year it was doubling. But it actually makes problems when it grows that quickly. Any business that grows that rapidly creates problems. And I had one customer, <coughs> who got a contract with a, a big company for his team. And my God, they, they moved to a new location, they bought all this new equipment, they hired staff, and all of a sudden that one company dropped them. They said, we're not going to sell this product anymore. They put them out of business. So there's a danger with being too, uh, too tied to one a business to, to one customer. So unless you're under some kind of contract that gives you protection, then you know you have to be careful. And, and I always believed in um, uh, uh, you know, spreading out uh, the, the load. Of, I had uh, not one shipper. I had two shippers, so that if, if something happened to one and and uh, you know they got killed, they got sick or something, I'd have the other to, to rely on. And I always had many suppliers, and I always had enough customers. And just as a formula, uh, I had, with my previous business, I had four customers that did half our business. And then about 500 customers that did the rest. Now that, that, that uh, has shifted somewhat. I have 10 customers that do half our business. And I think that's a healthy situation, because if, if you lose one customer, it's not going to affect the business. But I have a different problem that I think a lot of businesses would be happy to have, and that I don't want my business to grow, because I'm back in the situation where I'm working all the time, and I don't know how to hire someone. So my business grew 25% last year. That's too much. I'd rather it be steady, because now, you know, what I have to do is, is have enough money to get out of debt, and that's enough for me. I, I would love to retire someday, but I can't see 
an exit strategy unless I find someone who's interested in my business and will keep me involved with, with, with some percentage. Unfortunately, I, I thought I had that the last time I sold the business, but it didn't work out, and I found myself with no income. So I had to go back into the business after my non-compete expired in 10 years. But sorry, five years. Yes, question. Um, yes, you were talking about how they were just artificially raising the price because they thought that higher price would automatically mean better quality. Yes. How long do you think it would take until that backfires on them and well, they'll realize? Uh, it's, it's no one, very few people will go back and buy the same tea at that price because either they're going to find out it's common tea and they pay too much um, or uh, they're going to have to keep finding new customers who are willing to take that leap. Uh, the same thing happens in this country. There's so many tea country companies out there now because tea is a good business. You know, the tea industry, the tea market is expanding every year. So it was very easy for me to get into it. And I happen to get in at the right time, I think, because uh, now there's there's probably too many companies out there. And some of the companies have very high prices, but they don't seem to, to survive very long. So I don't know. I think if you want to have a sustainable business, you have to give someone a good value. So they're happy they bought the product and they share it with their friends. Because that's, that's always how my business <coughs> grew, is, is really by word of mouth. It wasn't that we got all this free advertising in newspapers and magazines. It was because we had happy customers. And that was the one thing. Another thing my father taught me is keep the customers happy. You know, they will tell their friends. You know, and that will do more for your business than any kind of marketing that you do, I believe. You know, to have happy, satisfied customers that tell other people about them. And I'm not computer savvy. I'm a real dinosaur when it comes to modern technology. So I don't rely on, on I, did, I wasn't even using the internet. I didn't have a, a website. I didn't have an email address. I used a fax machine. People wanted to order, they sent them a fax, or they got on the phone, which is more often. Um, so I, I was able to build my business without any aid of modern technology. And I'm not recommending that, but I, it's just that I didn't grow up in that period, and, and I, it was hard for me to learn this, this new world. I buy a computer, and, and two years later it was obsolete, and I, you know, I, I just had enough of that, so. Any other questions? Yes. Um, when you were in China, were you judging the quality of the tea just by tasting it, or were there certain things? Uh, you first, my nose, and then if I thought it was worthy of tasting, I would taste it. So uh, my modus operandi was to, you know, get all the teas that I wanted to taste for that day. And sometimes you have to make very quick decisions. Uh, meaning, if I didn't buy that tea by an hour later it would be gone because some farmer had carried that tea down to some town or market and if, if I recognized it as being a good tea, I had to make quick decisions. And I trusted my palate. That I, I, I'm good with. But uh, my biggest fear was that I would get a cold or something. So, And that happened sometimes. And every time I try to buy a tea and get it back here and I bought a sick, I was always disappointed that I had to either sell that tea off at cost or even at a loss because I made a mistake. So I was too reliant on my nerves and my tongue. I have one question. I can't remember if it was in the short video, but I was in the documentary last night. You were over in China, you were talking about the quality of the teas and the artisans who were making it and so forth. And you said something about these these people and these teas are going to be a thing of the past. What did, what did you mean by that? Uh, now, that film was shot 
1996-97, and there was no market for the really high-end teas. Those craftspeople struggled to sell their tea because, you know, there was so much tea on the market for two dollars a pound, and if they were trying to sell something for twenty dollars a pound, the Chinese weren't buying it. I would, I seemed to be their only customer. I recognized the quality of tea, and I did my best to support those highly skilled craftspeople who were making this tea. And I wanted them to be happy to sell their tea. And some of the people I bought tea from, I actually gave them more money they were, than they were asking. I would give them money to buy organic fertilizer. So it put me in a very good light with a lot of the farmers. But I knew that uh, when the Chinese businessmen come along and buy the same tea from that guy, they're going to drive the price down so low that they will put them out of business. And I saw it happen time and again. So many tea farmers abandoned their tea fields, moved to the cities, and took up a job shining shoes. And this is not an isolated case. Whenever I, I, I saw the shoe shine people, you know, I'd ask them, you know, what they did. And so many of them were tea farmers because they couldn't afford to pick their tea. Now that dynamic is changing somewhat, but it's still a, a very difficult world for not only tea farmers, anyone in the farming community. You could, any place in the world you go, you could ask any small family farm here, oh, how are you doing with your business? And it's, it's a challenge, it's a real struggle. Because we're all in competition with the corporate world. And you can't. You can't be in competition with the corporate world. We'll never be able to sell any product at the price that mass production is. If you have a handcrafted product, it's always going to cost more. And I'm really hoping these, these tea farmers in the Hawaiian Islands will be successful. But I know it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a challenge. Any other questions for David? Yeah. You yes. said your tea is a higher quality, obviously better tea. So is that something now, since I'm in the competition, is something you can find in a supermarket? Or do you have to go somewhere? Uh, you could find some of the similar teas, lookalikes, but if you taste them side by side, I think you'll find the teas that I bring in are far different and better from what's commercially available. It's, the, the tea market has raised considerably with the quality of what is available, but I'm, I guess I'm too picky with my teas and I, I go after the, the very best. But no, there, there are many more good teas in this country. It's still a buyer beware market. I would say you never pay lots of money for a tea until you've had a chance to taste it. Nice. All right, anything else? All right, thank you, David. Thank you.